Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back to Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. In this next segment, uh, we're going to hear from Minister Conroy, uh, Minister Mike Farnworth, and Minister uh, George Heyman, uh, talking about um, addressing climate change and budgets for 2022. Um, also regarding things that that happened with climate disasters of in 2021, like the flooding, um, there is going to be a, a budgeted uh, 1.5 billion dollars over the next three years that will support the province's ongoing response to recovery efforts for those people affected by the blood by the flooding. This includes $1.1 billion in contingencies to support those people, businesses, and communities that have been hit hard. It also will include the wildfire emergency response and prevention with uh, $145 million over the next three years to strengthen D.C.'s emergency management and wildfire service, including transforming the BC Wildfire Service into a year round firefighting and risk mitigation workforce. There's other things that go along with this uh, local emergency preparedness and mitigation, uh, climate change prepare, uh, preparedness, and uh, one quote from Selena Robinson about this: "We have all seen the impact that climate change is is making on people's lives in our community. That's why, while we we continue to fight against climate change, we are investing to strengthen our defenses so we can protect people, communities, and businesses from future." climate related disasters well budgeting is 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 going to be really really good the, that um the ndp um party here in british columbia is setting aside the funds to make these things happen we also need to see see the action from the funds come forth we need to see see these farms being rebuilt we need to see the communities like Lytton that was completely leveled by a firestorm get rebuilt so that people can return to their homes and live happy lives so uh, let's listen to what the ministers have to say about um, this new budget and plan for for a climate crisis. Follow up. With that, I will hand it over to Minister Selena Robinson. Thank you so much, Tara. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. This year, we have all experienced the destructive consequences of climate change. As communities were scorched by heat and wildfires in the summer and flooding and mudslides only a few months later. Recent climate related disasters have challenged British Columbians and reinforced the need to continue the fight against climate change. It has also shown that we need to come together. We need to come together to build back better from recent disasters and make sure people and communities throughout BC are protected from future disasters. That's why we are investing $2.1 billion to build back from fires and floods and to protect people and communities from future climate-related disasters. This includes funding to rebuild from last year's floods and wildfires, strengthen our defenses 
and respond to future wildfires, floods, and extreme weather events. And significant new funding for Emergency Management BC and BC Wildfire Service to respond to disasters with a proactive year-round service model. We know that investments in prevention and preparedness, we know that these investments will help to protect people, to protect communities, and to protect businesses from future climate-related disasters. So I'd like to ask Mike Farnworth, Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General, to join me to speak more about these initiatives. Minister Farnworth. Thank you, uh, and good morning, everyone. I'm honoured to be here on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples and the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. I'd like to start by acknowledging the extreme challenges people in our province have faced over the past year and beyond. Recently, during the November flooding, we saw countless communities work together to make sure that those stranded due to devastating slides got to safety, received food, blankets, and some degree of comfort. We saw the city of Abbotsford pull together to evacuate large parts of their community, including farmers desperate to save livestock. The Punjabi community in the Fraser Valley and other areas rallied to help many British Columbians in need. And here on Vancouver Island, the Halalt and Penalicut First Nations stepped up with leaders and responders from those nations working to minimize flood impacts. From wildfires and extreme heat to flooding and mudslides, the place we call home is at risk like never before from the effects of climate change. In response to these challenges, we know we need to make significant investments so that every person, every community, and together as a province, we are more resilient and prepared to face climate-related emergencies in the future. As part of Budget 2022, we are making significant investments to protect public safety. As has already been mentioned, we are moving the BC Wildfire Service to a year-round workforce so these professionals can support British Columbians in their wildfire preparedness, mitigation, response and recovery. At Emergency Management BC, we have made investments to expand our public alerting system and emergency search capacity to support people when it matters most. And to make sure that people and communities continue to receive timely and accurate information in the face of changing weather, the province is expanding the River Forecast Centre and floodplain mapping program. In all, more than $2.1 billion is going to help people on the ground recover and prepare now. To help communities rebuild stronger so they are better protected against future climate disasters and to make critical investments in our public safety infrastructure and response. To do this, $1.5 billion in new funding will be invested over the next three years to support the province's ongoing response and recovery efforts, including rebuilding more resilient infrastructure. This includes contingencies over the next three years to support those people, businesses and communities that have been impacted due to recent disasters. With this, we will be able to improve our supports for those impacted by floods as the needs become better known. We know that people who are applying for disaster assistance need this money as soon as possible. This past fall, Environment and Climate Change Canada described the flooding we've experienced as a once-in-a-century event. As testament to this, a record-breaking number of people have applied for disaster financial assistance. Within a one-week period, we received three times more applications than we usually receive in an entire year. And while the claims are being processed and this money is getting to people, we need to be nimble. And with Budget 2022, we're making investments to make this happen. We are strengthening our ability to protect public safety and transforming emergency management BC, adding more staff to improve capacity to support communities. With a strong focus on prevention, preparedness, response and recovery for wildfires, floods and all other hazards. We are also implementing a historic investment into the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Up until this budget, our government had contributed $77 million to this invaluable program. I am proud of the work our government has funded over the years. I am now very pleased to report that this budget allocates an additional $110 million to support communities and First Nations in funding things such as evacuation route planning, structural flood mitigation, volunteer fire department equipment and training, Indigenous cultural safety training, flood risk assessments and emergency operations centre training and supports. This program has been key to supporting First Nation and local government preparedness needs since its inception. And this record investment is, is going to really move the needle on emergency preparedness in the province. 
It's also important to note that the challenges we've faced over the recent years, the consecutive wildfires and flooding events, and the COVID-19 pandemic have disproportionately impacted Indigenous communities. And it is critical that we work side by side in partnership with First Nations to advance reconciliation by improving emergency management supports. First Nations will benefit from the record investment that this budget makes to Community Emergency Preparedness Fund, as well as an additional $10 million allocated to begin to address the needs of Indigenous communities. This means in total $120 million is being allocated to support both First Nations and local governments in realizing their emergency preparedness goals. With Budget 2022, we're taking aggressive action to protect public safety. We're working to help people on the ground recover, and we're helping communities to rebuild stronger so they're better prepared in the future. I'd like to now pass it to Katrina Conroy, Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farnworth, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. And I, too, would like to recognize the Indigenous nations on whose traditional territory we are gathered. I'm pleased to be speaking to you from the territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, the Sanhees and the Esquimalt nations. Along with my colleagues here, I'm really pleased to talk about the latest round of investments brought forward by Budget 2022 that will help improve the lives of British Columbians and, and build a stronger BC. From record flooding to unprecedented wildfires, the last couple of years have been challenging for many British Columbians. This past fire season, the Premier and I flew over fire-ravaged landscapes and visited impacted communities. We saw Lytton and spoke to the devastated residents and wildfire professionals. Some of those professionals had lost their homes and while still fighting other fires, and yet they continue to go out and to the front lines and fight the fires to protect people. They spoke to us about the need for wildfire mitigation and who better to do that work than the professional firefighters themselves, those people who understand the need for firefighting wild, wildfire mitigation. We witnessed firsthand what adaption during challenging and devastating conditions look like and the countless examples of resiliency, compassion, and a strong spirit of community and pulling together. I toured fire camps, talked to the incredible people who were sent out to fight those fires, people from all across the province, as well as support from other provinces and countries. I saw the devastation at Monty Lake and Paxton Valley, toured the Okanagan and Indian Band with Chief Lewis, and not only saw the destruction of his nation, but also saw the benefits of cultural burning and saw firsthand how the FireSmart program works when we met with the folks at Logan Lake and flew over their community. We know that climate change is contributing to drier and hotter summers, resulting in extended wildfire seasons, and it's highly likely that this trend will continue. We have seen the worst wildfire seasons on record in BC that have occurred all in the past five years. We are concerned about the impact on our lives, homes, local economies, forests, and wildlife. This is why our government is making significant investments to transform the BC Wildfire Service into a year-round service and shift from a reactive to a proactive approach. As part of Budget 2022, we are providing $145 million in new funding over three years that will strengthen BC's emergency management and wildfire services. These investments will allow BC Wildfire Service to work on all four pillars of emergency management prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. An additional $98 million over the fiscal plan will fund wildfire prevention work and maintain crucial Forest Service roads used to respond to forest fires. Budget 2022 also provides $90 million in community grants for the FireSmart program to help make homes and communities safer from wildfire risk. These investments are about people and our plan to support communities as we cope with the ongoing impacts of climate change. By transforming the BC Wildfire Service into a proactive year-round service, we're working to help people on the ground better prepare for and recover from future wildfires. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce the Minister of Environment, Minister uh, George Heyman.
Thank you very much, Minister Conroy. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. As my colleagues have all said, uh, last summer delivered a devastating message. And I want to begin my remarks by acknowledging uh, the devastation that so many people felt who lost their homes, lost their communities, lost their livestock, and lost economic stability. And I want to thank them and all British Columbians who had each other's back, who stood together to support each other through an extremely difficult time. But the message is absolutely clear. We're not waiting another decade or two to see the impacts of climate change. We're experiencing it today in ways we have never experienced it before. And I think we all know that we can expect to experience even more of that in the coming years. And that's why it's so important that the investments in Budget 2022 speak to the urgency with which our government takes this challenge and our need to act. We need to protect people and communities from climate fuel disasters. We need to help communities build back stronger and with more resiliency from the past year. And that's why we have a total of more than $2.1 billion dedicated to that. But we also know we need to expand our ability to plan for the future to address the potential impacts of climate change. It's not enough to react. We need to be able to predict, we need to be able to prepare, and we need to be able to invest. Planning starts with good data, with good information. That's what will inform the right actions. The Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy developed through my ministry in cooperation with other ministries across government has been out for public discussion. We had an initial investment in the last budget, and we will be building on both science and Indigenous knowledge to implement the strategy which will be announced in the coming months. Knowledge systems will continue to drive decision making so that we can better anticipate where we need to take stronger action to protect people, to protect people's homes, and to protect their communities as well as the lives they lead. That's why Budget 2022 has the most significant investments to fight the climate crisis that this province has ever seen. Among the measures of the Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy, which as I mentioned will be released shortly, will be expanded climate monitoring networks, new equipment in the field monitoring stream flows, groundwater, snowpack, to help us improve our planning for future climate impacts. There will be new climate resilience initiatives with local and Indigenous governments. There will be an extreme heat response framework so that should there be a future heat dome, should there be future increased temperatures, that our communities are better able and set up to support our people. And there'll be an expanded river forecast center and provincial floodplain, floodplain mapping program. Investments in healthy watersheds, which began last year as part of our Stronger Recovery Program, are again included in this year's budget because we know that investing in uh, watershed rehabilitation helps protect us from flooding and helps protect the ecosystems on which so much of our economy depends. It also provides important employment and engagement for Indigenous, Indigenous youth and others. This is a very substantial response and it underlines the need we all feel to prepare now to invest in the measures we know that we need to take to ensure that British Columbians know that they have a more secure future, to ensure that British Columbians know that their government is planning for that future, not only to invest in measures to reduce our impacts on climate change, but to acknowledge that it is here, its impact will be felt for years, and we need to protect people, communities, our economy, and our province. Thank you. Minister Robinson. I want to thank my colleagues. Um, we are making strong investments to build back better from recent disasters. 
and ensure people and communities are protected from climate-related events. In moments of crisis, the BC Wildfire Service and Emergency Management BC have been unwavering in their response, and we owe them our thanks and so much more. No single community should have to rebuild or move forward on its own. We are in this together, and as a government, we are committed to ensuring people and communities have the resources that they need to face the, the, this challenge, uh, not just for today, but for years to come. We need to do this while also ensuring that we can protect people and communities right across the province. Thank you for being here uh, with us today, and we're happy to take your questions. And I have colleagues here to help answer them. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Zhao Zhu, Globe and Mail. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, thousands of people remain displaced as a result of both fire and floods. When will these funds, both from BC and the money from Ottawa, has promised flow so that they can rebuild and uh, return home? Uh, thank you for the question. That uh, process uh, is uh, already underway uh, in a number of communities that have been impacted by floods and fires. Uh, we have had assessors out to assess the damage uh, on uh, individual uh, properties uh, and then been working with them in order to determine uh, the eligibility and the funding that, they're gonna be, that they will uh, require. Uh, and so that work is, is ongoing. Zhao, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, your budget promises more money for climate monitoring and extreme heat uh, response plan. Will those measures be in place before this summer? Thank you. It's an important question. As I mentioned, uh, we have $83 million in this year's uh, budget for the climate preparedness and adaptation strategy, and uh, we'll be kicking that off uh, uh, later, uh, late, uh, late winter, early spring, uh, setting up uh, the networks that we need to do that monitoring and preparation. It will be ongoing. It will obviously not all be in place uh, in order to take the data and make some of the predictions that uh, we would all hope we would have uh, for this summer, but it is a critical piece of being prepared for the years to come. Next question comes from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, this is for Minister Farnworth. The uh, ICBC has provided some data around COVID-19 related tickets. It shows just over a quarter of the fines have been paid. Does this send a message to British Columbians that broke COVID-19 law and the large repercussions considering that so many of those tickets have not been paid? Um, absolutely not. Uh, we want to be clear, and we were clear when we made the, uh, the announcements in terms of the tickets, uh, that uh, when uh, 30 days pass uh, and you have not disputed the ticket, uh, then it will be uh, sent to a collection agency. On top of that, we know that a significant number of the tickets are in fact being disputed. Uh, and I would also add the following point, that uh, at the end of the day, uh, when you go to renew your ICBC insurance, uh, you have to pay the fine. Uh, and so those tickets uh, will be paid. Uh, it may take a little time, but they will be paid. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Uh, some of the charges have also been stayed. Uh, some of the more significant ones linked to uh, religious gatherings that at the time was a slap in the face of the policies that have been put in place by government. Are you? Um, what do you think of the, these decisions being stayed? And considering uh, we are working our way through the tail end of the pandemic, uh, is the thought that more of these could be stayed, uh, as some experts have indicated? Um, whenever there is an investigation that is done by uh, the, the, the police and whether a ticket is uh, issued, uh, it is potentially, uh, it can be disputed. Um, and decisions around staying are not made by ICBC, they're not made by me. Uh, they would be addressed, uh, if, you know, when, when, when issues have been placed by uh, by. Uh, uh, out of the uh, Attorney General's uh, ministry. Uh, but uh, when, st when tickets are issued, uh, we fully expect that uh, if they're not disputed, um, they will, uh, you know, you're going to have to pay the fine. And, and as I said, if your insurance is, uh, is up for renewal, you're going to have to pay that fine. And then, of course, when they are disputed, they will go through the, uh, through the court process 
and that is handled, um, you know, separately through the, the, the Ministry of the Attorney General. Next question comes from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Thank you very much. I'd like to go back to the discussion about the displacement of people. Um, Minister, the best you have to offer is that you're doing an assessment now. I mean, these people have been out of their homes from between six to eight months. Is there nothing further you can offer them about when they might see a return? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I was uh, that was the first part of the answer, and then I was expecting a supplemental, which was actually on a different topic. Uh, there's been a significant amount of work in terms of people returning home. Uh, as we know, in the case of, uh, of, of Merit, the vast majority of people have returned home. Uh, the, as, as I said earlier, the homes are assessed. Uh, and at one point, you know, we had over 7,000 people uh, out of their homes. Uh, they were, the homes have been assessed by green, yellow and red uh, in terms of their ability to be inhabited. Uh, and obviously the ones that are green you can go back to. Uh, the assessment on those that are done that were, 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 were yellow, uh, people are able to return. They may require some, some additional uh, um, you know, uh, repair uh, or cleaning. Those are by and large. Uh, we are now getting to the ones where there are the, those that have the, the, um, the home is uninhabitable, for example, and those people are in accommodation. Uh, and will continue to be supported through the Red Cross uh, until such time as they are as they are able to to uh, to return home. Um, and what's critical in that, of course, is getting a proper assessment, getting the money out out the door for those for those individuals. Uh, and we want them back as as quickly as possible. But the key element, of course, is ensuring that the supports are in place and that they know those supports are going to be there, and they are and will continue to be. Lisa, do you have a follow up? Thank you for that, Minister. Um, I would like to ask a general question about the, um, the climate preparedness uh, strategy um, we will see soon. Um, critics have said that you know the whole green, clean BC um, uh, program is is kind of an industry greening initiative that are for really greenwashing the fracked gas industry. And I'm wondering about you know things that the UN has said about fossil fuel development. Why in BC are we embarking on, um, you know, the growth of an LNG industry at the same time that we're, um, you know, we're seeing the effects of climate change and you're trying to spend, and you're going to have to spend all this money to try to mitigate and prevent climate disasters. Thank you very much for the question. Um, we're in the midst of a very significant transition. And British Columbia, frankly, is a leader in that transition on the continent. But we know we have much more to do. Uh, what some people call uh, support for a gas industry is part of responding to the call of our Climate Solutions Council, which includes climate experts and environmental leaders, as well as people from industry, to ensure that as we transition, we support people and we support jobs in emission-intensive trade-exposed industries. So we are taking a portion of the carbon tax paid by industry, and we are rewarding uh, those industries that are world-leading in terms of reducing emissions, and we are joining with others in making significant capital investments to drive down their emissions in uh, industries like, uh, like pulp and paper, like mining, like forestry, and yes, in the gas industry, which still supplies gas uh, that many British Columbians rely on. And while we're transitioning to electrification, the fact remains that we still have people in British Columbia and elsewhere uh, relying on, uh, on that sector. Uh, our program, the Clean BC program for industry, was recognized in Glasgow with an award as the most creative government climate program among over 126 uh, regional and subnational governments. We're proud of the way uh, we're implementing climate action in BC. We're proud of the Clean BC program. And yes, we acknowledge that we're in a crisis and we all have much more to do. And that's why we're tweaking and updating the program every chance we get. And where we see the opportunity to, to do more, we push hard to do that. The next question comes from Chad Klassen, CFJC TV Kamloops. Thanks, guys, for taking my question. Uh, this is a question for Minister Conroy, perhaps Minister Farnworth as well. I'm wanting to get a better picture of what a year-round BC Wildfire Service will look like. Minister Conroy, I know you sort of 
touched on some of the details, $90 million for fire smart programs, among other things. Sounds like it's going to be maybe a combined effort between the wildfire service and local communities. Can you give me a little more insight into what exactly that will look like? I certainly can and want to acknowledge that Kamloops is actually the home of the BC Wildfire Centre, the, the main centre. And, and to, just to start there, we are going to be able to have people working at centres year-round, people that are going to be able to not only uh, look at, uh, to do the wildfire work during the wildfire season, but actually able to do the mitigation. And who better than uh, firefighters? who know what, what they need to do when it comes to mitigation. Um, they will be working with communities, you're right, there's $90 million there for communities, Indigenous nations across this province, so that uh, they can uh, engage in the, in the Fire Smart program. We saw full round, the, the uh, effects of that program at, uh, for instance, at Logan Lake, as I mentioned, and we saw the fire where it came up to Logan Lake and then it just moved away from the community because of the work that they had done, the mitigation that they had done, and we want to see that in communities right across the province. So this money will ensure that we have uh, people working year-round, uh, that we have people that will be able to go out and work with communities, work with Indigenous nations. And it's interesting, the former question came, for, uh, said, uh, referred to a report from the UN, well, uh, yesterday or this morning, actually a report came out from the UN that said one of the ways that countries around the world have to deal with wildfires is have uh, mitigation so that there was an annual mitigation, and that's exactly what we're doing. So we're moving in the right direction. We are going to be able to help communities communities across this province. The wildfire people, the, the folks are extremely excited about it because it's something that they have been asking for for years and now we are going to be able to implement it. So thank you. Chad, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks for that, Minister Conroy. Another question for you and really anyone else that wants to chime in. Uh, Camelot's MLA, one of the Camelot's MLAs here, Todd Stone, told me yesterday, and pardon me, this is a bit of a long-winded question. He feels that the NDP has, quote, thrown up the white flag and has turned its back on the forest industry, specifically with your old-growth logging policy. Uh, mills in the interior and the lower mainland say they could be out of business pretty soon if that policy doesn't change. Um, specifically, shake and shingle mills say they might be completely out of wood in the next three weeks because they solely rely on old growth to make their product. Um, Minister Conroy and others, uh, that seems pretty grave. What's your response to all that? Well, my response, especially to Minister Stone, is I wish the ministry, uh, minister uh, 10 years ago had taken the initiatives that needed to be taken to deal with the issues that we're facing today. You know, there was a report that came out in 2015 that said about the, the repercussions from pine beetle that needed to be dealt with, and the minister of the day ignored that report and did nothing. And I will not be sitting here 10 years from now or wherever I'll be 10 years from now saying, I wish that I had done something. We have to do something so that we not only have have a forest industry for generations to come. We have forests for generations to come. And so we are looking at ensuring that we protect the most, um, the oldest and the most ancient forests, the most vulnerable forests in our, in, our pro in our province. We are looking at engaging with Indigenous nations and sharing with those nations on whose traditional territories these forests lie. That sharing, fair, fair that has, has not been done for years, so sharing with those Indigenous nations. And also looking at ways that we can work with communities um, to ensure that they are also, and workers are also getting fair value from the uh, forest industry. We are working with the industry. We are working with workers and, and communities to ensure that anybody who is affected by the old growth deferrals will be compensated. We are looking at ways of uh, bridging to retirement. We've had many people that have come forward and said they want a bridge to retirement so that younger people can continue to work, and that is working. We are looking at uh, supports to communities that could be affected by this. You know, we we are doing, like, there's considerable dollars, there's well over $200 million that are being, uh, that's being spent to look at better ways that we can um, engage the forest industry in things like the bioeconomy, like looking at uh, taking uh, products from the forest industry and using them in a way that's never been used before, taking the salvage wood out of the forest and, and instead of leaving it there to, to burn, which is not good for our GHG or the, uh, it, or the environment, look, utilizing that in all kinds of different opportunities in the forest industry. And so we were talking to a number of industries who are excited about it, who can see a huge a future. And there is investment in the forest industry in this province, and I'm, I'm quite excited about it. And I should stop now because I could keep going on. <laughs> Our next question. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.